Thanks. Thank you for leading us in that song. It's a great way to take us into God's word. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys today. It's actually a great privilege. The last two Sundays I've been away, I've not been here, and and part of realized how much I miss being a part of this this body, this community, my friends and my brothers and sisters in Christ. So, um, yeah, it's good to be back. If you wouldn't mind opening your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1, we are going to be looking at a prayer that Paul gives for his fellow saints there at the church of Ephesus. And as you heard Pastor Greg say earlier, uh, this is something that we are doing together. It's just not a sermon series that we are doing, and hopefully that you're sitting, listening, and taking in, but hopefully you are getting into it with us. We've invited you to grab a journal, to take that journal and go through these passages with us each day of the week uh, in preparation for these Sunday mornings. Um, And I really enjoy the fact, uh, even this week a few times, I've been able to talk to people about what they've been reading in this, you know, hopefully maybe just to get a little bit of sermon prep too. Like, you know, maybe they're, but everybody that I've talked to has highlighted something a little bit different than what you're probably going to hear from me today, which isn't to say that they're wrong and I'm right or I'm right or, or whatever. It's that there's so much in this and that God speaks to us and speaks it to us at different points in his word that, that we all can learn from each other and to teach each other with this. And so... Um, as Greg said, come on out tonight uh, when we do our share groups and, and be a part of that process with each other. Um, now, Ephesians, it's one of those great, rich books. Uh, I've heard someone say that it, in, an, in and of itself, is sort of the distilled essence of the entire gospel itself, that you can find it all there in the book of Ephesians. Um, And just the big picture of what this book looks like, uh, the first three chapters is all about enjoying God's triumph. The things that God has done, the things that he's doing, the things that he's going to do uh, to restore and reclaim all things. And then those chapters four through six talk about proclaiming God's triumph. How are we supposed to live that out practically? Uh, In light of the truths of what God has done, how do we live that out? Uh, What are those practical implications for it? So um, I'm really excited about this this entire series. So um, pray with me uh, as we get into this just a little bit. Father, we come before you this morning grateful for who you are and what you've done. And even as I say that, God, I realize that there are times where that is just a a statement that is said, and I don't fully comprehend who you are and what you've done. Um, Yet you invite us today and specifically in this passage to to get to know you better, to understand, to see you with different eyes. And so God, I pray that that will be true today, that, that you will speak to us through your word, uh, that you will transform us through your word, um, and that we would see you in in fresh new ways, that it will come out in how we live. And Father, even as I've prepared this week, I recognize that there have been times where I did not allow these truths to be transforming the way that I thought, the way that I behaved, 
the way that I spoke. And so there's still things that you have to say to me in this to make me more like your son, to appreciate who you are. And so, God, I pray that you will do that. And in all this, God, I pray that you would unite us, unite this body to honor you, to love other people. So, God, we thank you for this time that we have. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, by way of review, I just want to remind you, since it, it's been two weeks that, since we as a church have kind of got over this passage, but two weeks ago, Pastor Greg talked about the first part of chapter one. And that entire first part, some call it a doxology, but it's really Paul praising God for his provision that comes to his people according to his sovereign plan in Christ by the Spirit. Um, Paul writes this beautiful hymn of praise, praising God the Father, all that he has given to us as believers, which is according to his plan in Jesus that is finished and brought to fruition by the Holy Spirit. If you remember, this passage talks about how the Father chose us before the beginning of the world, that we were adopted into his family, that we have redemption through the blood of Jesus, that we have forgiveness of sins, that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, and that this is for all people, not just for the Jews who are his chosen people, but for us as Gentiles, that we're also included in his plan of salvation. And all of this was simplified in the verse that we've encouraged everybody to, to memorize for this section in chapter 1. So I don't know how many of you have done that, have made an attempt to do it. It's a fairly simple verse this time, and if you didn't, that's okay. But I would like us all to read it together um, and just let it, let it soak in a little bit of what Paul is saying in this, the 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 plan and the provision that God has for us. So let's read this together. It's Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So we are praising God as he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, sometimes we don't know fully what that means. You know, how has he blessed us? What are these spiritual blessings? And, and he, we unpack all of this uh, as we go through it. But this is, this is Paul's praise. And the second half of chapter one is a prayer that he's gonna give uh, for insight into God's plan and provision for his people. In particular, he's praying that they, and in essence that we, might really see things differently. That they and we would know and understand those things that he has just been praising God for. Verse 15 starts out with this phrase, for this reason. In other words, in everything that he had just been giving praise to God for, He's praying these things to be true for our understanding, that we would understand these things that we're praising God for. It's kind of like sometimes that, you know, we might sing a song and there are great truths that we sing about, but we don't really let those words sink in and affect us. And that's what he's doing here. He's saying, you've heard these words. Now I pray that you'll let those words sink in and really Get to the heart of your thinking. So he's driving home these truths of his praise by praying that his readers would move from head knowledge to heart knowledge. That they would be shaped by these truths. Um, That we would do more than just casually say, 
well, you know, it, it's cool that God adopted me. But that we would somehow allow the truth of that adoption to affect, of how, affect how we live and how we respond to the world around us. So again, if you have your Bibles, make sure you're in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 15. And we're going to... I'm going to read this, and the, the version I have on the screen up here is going to be out of the NIV. If, you're, if you have a different version, that's okay. Um, just don't get lost as we go along. Um, but I'm going to read these verses, to, and you can follow along quietly, or if you want. If you want to read aloud, it's okay too. So. But Ephesians 1.15 starts this way. It says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus... And your love for all God's people. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So as I said, this section is a prayer for insight into God's plan and provision for his people. And as I read this, I see that this section... Is, can be broken down into four simple parts. There's a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer that they would know the Father better, a prayer for enlightenment, and a celebration of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. So let's take a closer look at each of these parts, and then I'll have a few comments at each of them. But the first one is his prayer of thanksgiving. says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. You see, the word on the street was that these people, that the Ephesian church had faith and that they loved other people. And it wasn't just that they were people of faith. You know, we hear, you know, all the time, and uh, even Greg talked about it three weeks ago in his, in his introduction uh, to the book of Ephesians, that, you know, there are people of faith, just like there are people of faith in our country today. The Ephesians were people of faith. They, they had faith in, in sort of the dark arts, the spirit world, and other things that were not a true faith. But the word that Paul got is that the church at Ephesus, in the midst of all that, had a faith in Jesus Christ. He was the object of their faith. And that their faith moved them to act with love toward other people. Now, the, the book of Revelation actually praised the, the church at Ephesus. Jesus, as he's talking to the church, there in Revelation chapter 2, said, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. At one point in this church, they knew who their first love was, and they had a deep, powerful faith in Jesus. They were people whose reputation for their faith in Jesus and their love for the saints, 
that led Paul to thank God for them. You know, we have this slogan on our building, and I think it's in our bulletins. We talk about it all the time. Our slogan is that we exist to honor God and to love people. And it actually goes on to say, to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That slogan, honor God, it's faith. To love people, obviously, is love. And is that a true reflection of who we are as a people, as a church? Let me ask you this. If, if someone across the world were to hear about EBC, what would they say about us? You know, if one of our missionaries went back to their country, say Justin Jenna Dotson went back to France, and they were to talk about us here in Xenia, what would they say about us? Could they talk about our faith in Jesus Christ and how well we loved each other? Or would they say, yeah, you know, they're, they're really nice people and I'm glad that they support our ministry, but yeah, they as a church spend too much time squabbling over trivial issues. You know, they care more about worship styles and whether or not they're getting their own, you know, spiritual itches scratched. And they care about those things more than they care about loving each other. Better yet, what if somebody in our own town were to hear about us? You know, what would they say? Well, yeah, sure, they put on a good service. That, that Grayson guy, he can sing. That mayor, not only is she a good leader, but she's a good singer too. Eh, but eh, they're not a very welcoming church. Is that what they'd say? Let's bring it a little bit closer to home. What do people say about you? What reputation do you have? You know, can your neighbors say, yeah, he's the real deal. I don't get this Jesus thing, but he really seems to believe it. and He's, he's the genuine thing. Or would they say, yeah, I know they call themselves a Christian, but it could fool me with the kind of things I hear them write on Facebook or Instagram. Do you have the kind of faith and love that is worthy of Thanksgiving, or is this just what you do on Sunday mornings? Paul thanked God for the faith and love reported about the church at Ephesus. And I hope that can be said about us as well. The second thing in here is, it's a prayer to know God better. Verse 17 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So to what purpose does Paul pray for the church there? Now, throughout Paul's writings, you're, you're, you will see a Trinitarian theme, uh, the, this Trinitarian thought that what the Father planned and purposed is accomplished in the Son, and it's brought to fruition and applied through the Holy Spirit. A great example of this, you can see in verses 11 through 14 there in chapter 1, where it talks about our salvation, how it's God's plan um, that that we are included in Jesus and that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Um, that he, the Holy Spirit is our deposit. And that, that Trinitarian theme is, uh, is, is woven throughout all of Paul's writings, and especially here in this book of Ephesians. But I will say this, I'm not sure that that's completely true here in verse 17. Although I know that some of our translations have it that way. The NIV does, that I read out of. Uh, and so does the ESV. I actually like how it reads in the New Living Translation, uh, as well as the NAS, where it says that he's asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you a sp spiritual wisdom 
and insight so that you may know, grow in your knowledge of God. The NAS says a spirit of wisdom. And the reason that I, I don't think that this is specifically a Trinitarian thought in this is, is in part, um, it, it reflects the verses uh, of 7 and 8 in chapter 1, where it says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So notice the, the, the similar wording. And later on he says that we were marked with the Holy Spirit. So, so Paul doesn't need to ask God to give us the Holy Spirit. He doesn't need to give us the Holy Spirit for wisdom and, and revelation because we already have the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's why I, I, I kind of like how the NLT and the NAS um, have it, but that, that the spirit that we already have would give us understanding and wisdom. But the thought there is nonetheless still the same. The end result is that Paul prays that they would know God better. Now this seems a little bit like an odd prayer, or maybe an overly simplistic prayer, um, Maybe, maybe just a wee bit unpractical in the light of their situation. So without a doubt, the church at Ephesus there had a lot of practical, pressing needs, just like we do in our country today. Paul could have prayed for those practical and pressing things. He could have been praying for their health and their, their, you know, their sick family members, and we all do need to be praying for those. Because those are important to God and to each other. But he doesn't just touch on the, those very immediate practical things. He talks about a much bigger practical thing. See, Ephesus was a major port town. I was sitting there on the west coast of Turkey and and it was filled with all the typical wicked and vice type things that port towns are known for. It was filled with crime and corruption. As I already mentioned, Ephesus was uh, fixated on mysticism and the dark arts. Uh, Ephesus is also known for its large temple of Artemis, the temple of Diana which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, with all of its cult worship and its eroticism and sexuality. It was a big, wicked town. And in the midst of that, the church was called to live a holy life. It sounds like quite a bit like us today. We are living in a, a wicked culture filled with crime and corruption and false spiritualism, and rampant sexuality just kind of thrown in our faces. What is the church supposed to do in the midst of that? How are they supposed to remain pure in a culture like that? How do we raise our kids to not accept that as the norm and the right thing to do? How do we have a job in a secular marketplace that is surrounded with the warped sexual norms of the culture. Those questions are the same questions they were asking back then, and certainly we're asking them now. You know, we can't go to the movies without being bombarded with images of immorality and sex. We can't watch a TV show or a commercial without some company trying to virtue signal us uh, with their support for and their normalizing of different things within our community. And I find it interesting that Paul does not pray that they know how to respond to those things. And he doesn't pray that they know how to respond to their culture like that. He doesn't pray for their health, though that's important. 
He doesn't pray for their wealth and prosperity. He doesn't address any of these so-called practical concerns. He prays that they will know God better. And you might ask, well, how does that help us? That just doesn't seem very practical for, our, our, for what we're going through. You know, I want to know what I need to do to respond to those things. But Paul's prayer is profoundly practical here. And if we fail to see the importance of this, we will continue to lose in the culture wars. Because instead of asking, what should I do? Or maybe instead of complaining that the church doesn't meet all of our felt needs, we should realize the answer to dealing with our culture like this is found exactly in what Paul is praying. That we know God better. He's not saying that we know more information about God. It's not just taking another Bible class at Cedarville or some other thing or coming to another Sunday school class here. It's to know him as a person, to know him in relationship, to know him for who he is, what he's like, and what he's done. When we have wisdom and understanding of who he is and what he's done, our response to the things of this world changes dramatically. Well, you might still say that this doesn't seem very practical. But I would come back and say, well, without question, it is precisely the practical thing. And these next few verses in this next section unpacks that a little bit for us. The third thing that, that Paul prays for is that it's a prayer of enlightenment. Verses 18 through 20 say, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you are called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The eyes of your heart, your inner eyes, your heart being the, the seat of your understanding. He wants us to know these things on a heart level, not just a head level. You know, in other words, if we were to use a more modern idiom, Paul would be praying you know, that the light bulb would turn on. That they would come to an aha moment about who God is. Or that the coin drops. Oh, I know that idiom's probably lost on some of you here. We used to have these things that hung on the wall. They were, they were called pay phones. I don't know if you're not familiar with those. You used to put this thing in it called a coin, which was this metal piece of money. And, and when you put that money into the pay phone, is this new for some of you? So you, you'd put this coin into the pay phone, and when the, you, you dial the number, and then when the call connected, the coin would kind of drop into the back. It would take your money. And when the coin dropped, then you knew you were connected. Okay, so that's what that idiom is. What Paul is saying, I pray that the coin would drop in your faith, that you would make a connection here, that you would get it. And there are three things that Paul prays that they would be enlightened about. The hope of their calling, his hope, his inheritance in the saints, and his power for us. So his hope, his inheritance, and his power. So hope, what is that? How can we know hope? I mean, we often think of hope as something like wishful thinking. You know, I, I, I wish for a million dollars. I hope for a million dollars someday. You know, I hope that the Lions would win the Super Bowl. Not going to happen. I hope that Michigan would have a better record than Ohio State. Too soon? Is that, is that too soon? All right, sorry. Just so you know, we do. But anyway, um, 
I hope that Michigan beats Ohio State. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, anyway, when the New Testament talks about hope, it's not this kind of wishful thinking. The New Testament hope isn't some kind of uncertainty that you're thinking maybe sort of might happen. It would be a really good thing if it did. The hope that is referred to by Paul and throughout the New Testament is that you may know what is the hope. Hope is the assurance of a reality that they have not yet fully experienced. The assurance of a reality that they have not yet fully experienced. One author said it this way, hope is faith standing on tiptoe. You, you think of meeting somebody at the airport and, or, or someplace, and you know that they're coming, and you're looking up over it, trying to, you know they're coming, but I'm looking, I want to see them first. I want to see them soon. Hope is that. You know they're coming around the corner, and I need a glimpse of it as soon as I can. That's what hope is. And what is the hope of our calling? Well, the first part in Ephesians 1, our calling is that we are chosen, that we are predestined, that we are under the headship of Christ, that we exist for the praise of his glory. That is what we are called to. And Paul wants them to know the significance of God's choosing them and make them, making them a part of his family. If we know the significance of that, it will have a dramatic impact on how we choose to live. Christian hope has its tilt toward the future. And our biggest and surest hope lies in the fact that we know what the future holds. We have been promised, and thus we know that this world is not our home. We have been promised, and we know that death is not the end of our journey. This will come out in a few verses later, but we have the hope of the resurrection. As Charles Spurgeon put it, a believer's hope leaps over the grave and lands him in a glorious resurrection. We talk about this every time there's a baptism in our church. Um, drawing out of, of Romans 6, verses 4 and 5, it says, We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him in death like his, for if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know the future. There is a resurrection that awaits us. And knowing that future gives us hope for the present. And this hope has very practical implications. Think about how, how Paul viewed it uh, he, as he wrote about in 2 Corinthians. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We also carry around in our body the death, the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. It's hope that allows us to go through these trials and come out on the other side. It's hope that allows us to say that the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. It's hope that allows us to say that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, even when some of those days feel really rotten. It's hope that says that we're not afraid to die because we know that we will come into possession for the things that are truly the best possessions. It's hope that allows us to know that there will be a day when this sinful body of ours 
will have absolute perfection. That we'll have a new body. It's a hope that we have that lets us know that our sins are truly forgiven. That we have been acquitted of our sins. Again, Spurgeon put it this way. We carry a bag of spending money in our hands, but the bulk of our wealth is deposited in the bank of hope. So the first thing that Paul wants people to be enlightened with is this idea of the hope that comes from God, his hope. The second thing is his inheritance. The riches of his inheritance in his holy people. Now this is another section where the intended meaning meaning is a bit ambiguous. And there are two ways to read this. One is to say that the inheritance is his to give to us. And the other way is to say that it's an inheritance that is his. That's an inheritance that something he gets. Either way, uh, I've, I've, I heard Alistair Begg say this, that either way that you read it, it's different sides of the same coin. It's true that we will get an inheritance, that there are things waiting for us at the end. That there is eternal life, that there is forgiveness of sins, that we are heirs with God, uh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That we have all the rights and privileges of being an adopted child of God. All those things are true. And, and certainly it would not hurt us at all to understand those things better. But I do really believe that the second way of reading this, that the inheritance is something that he is receiving, is the right way. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That he is getting an inheritance that is valuable and glorious. And we need to understand what is so valuable to God and why. And you might say, as I did, well, well, that doesn't make sense. God owns everything. He owns the cattle in a thousand hills. The mountains are his. The valleys are his. The stars are his handiwork too. He doesn't need to get an inheritance. He owns it already. So what is his inheritance? If that's the right way to read it, what is his inheritance and why is it so valuable? I believe this is something that is taught throughout Scripture in so many different ways. It's there in Ephesians 2. I don't want to go back all the way to Deuteronomy. You don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 32, you could start in verse 1. I'm going to start in verse 7. Deuteronomy 32, 7 says, remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind He set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. But get this. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is allotted inheritance. I'll be honest. I tried to write this in such a way that I wouldn't cry. (laughs) I don't get this. But this is a truth I think we all need to grasp somehow. Malachi 3.16 draws upon that same theme where it says, the Lord paid attention and heard them and the book of remembrance was written for him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possessions, And I will spare them as a man spares his son and serves him. We are his inheritance. Get that. God owns everything. 
but we are his inheritance. You know, we think of an inheritance as something, you know, it's a really cool gift that gets handed down from us from one generation to another, you know. You know, I would think of it this way, that if God were to get an inheritance of a car, he would need a fully restored 1967 candy apple red convertible Mustang. That's something God deserves as an inheritance. But if, if we're his inheritance, if I'm his inheritance, I think of myself as a rusted out 1978 Buick Caprice with a two by six as a front bumper. I mean, it's a car I had in high school. Call it the one-eyed beast. It was a jalopy. It was awful. And I think if, if I'm his inheritance, he's getting a raw deal. I mean, I know you guys, most of you, a lot of you guys. I love you guys. But if you're his inheritance, God's getting a raw deal. So if, if we're God's inheritance, why is it such a big deal that we know that, that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened by this? Well, consider, I want to consider two word pictures. Consider the housing market. You know, as this, my kids are getting ready to go off to college. My wife and I, we want to invest in a rental property that she could live off campus someday. It's got to be cheaper than living on campus, right? Anyway, so there's this house over on Miller Street that is a dive. I mean, it's a dive. It needs tons of work. And it's up for auction right now. started at like 65000 and right now it's over 81000 it's going to need $120,000 worth of renovations. But somebody's going to pay $80,000 for this dive of a house. Why is it worth so much? Not just because it's in Cedarville. Why is it? It's worth so much because somebody's willing to pay that much money. It's crazy. It's worth it because that's the price that somebody's willing to pay. Here's another example. Another word picture. Uh, any art people out there and recognize these things. People call this art. I don't know. Go figure. And the first one is by this guy named Kazimir Malevich. Some Russian dude. The one on the left sold for $60 million. My six-year-old left scraps of paper on the table that looked just like that. And I threw it away. Who knew? The, the one on the right, my wife knew what this is. This is a Jackson Pollock that was initially bought out of somebody's garage sale for like five bucks. And then sold a bunch of years later for $32.6 million. My six-year-old could have done that. I could have done that in my sleep. I mean, that, that might be the drool on my pillow. I don't know. Somebody was willing to pay that. The worth of something is measured by how much someone is willing to pay. If you look throughout all of creation, if you look at the fabulous mountain ranges. If you look up in the sky, and you see photos of our universe. If you look at all the animals that God made, not one of those things did God pay for with the life of his son. When he looks at you, he was willing to pay for you with the life of his son. The value of something is what someone is willing to pay for. 
And why is the inheritance of the saints, his inheritance of us so valuable? Why is that a big deal? Because he was willing to pay for us with his son. Again, I appeal to Spurgeon. He says, look, if you will, to all the majestic halls of heaven where the lamps of glory are lit with splendor, and su- with supernatural splendor. But neither angel, nor cherubim, nor seraphim cost the Lord a bloody sweat. Then look at his people. View his inheritance in the saints. For it is there that the Son of God, taking upon himself human nature, sighed and groaned and sweat great drops of blood and felt the agonies of death. As the Lord looks over all that he has made, he sees nothing that cost him suffering and death till he comes to his people. Jesus knows what the saints cost him. And measured by that standard, God has indeed riches of glory in his inheritance in the saints. Why does Paul pray that we understand the riches of his glory, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Because Paul wants us to know the depth of God's love for us and the value that he places on us. And the extreme price that God was willing to pay so that we can be in a relationship with him. Well, the third thing that he wants us to be enlightened about is his power. And I will say this, I'm not going to get through this. I never intended to get through this as we look at time. This is where if you come back tonight and talk about it in your share groups, I know that there are some of us who, who really landed on this point, talking about God's power. But I want to say this. This is a theme that he starts out here uh, in verse 19 and carries on all the way through to chapter 2, verse 10. But he stacks adjectives to describe God's power. His great power, his mighty strength, something that he exerted. All that, all these adjectives seem really unnecessary when he gets to the very next part that says, it's the power that raised Christ from the dead. Boom, trump card. Drop the mic. There's no other power like that in the world. He wants, Paul wants us to understand the power that God has for us. It's not a power that we have to use. It's not why we, it's why we can't walk around saying, you know, I give you a million dollars and I heal you and, and you, you know, get out of my way. That's not the kind of power that it's talking about here. It's his power for us to live this life, to overcome temptation to love the unlovable, to forgive when we've been hurt or slandered or abused. It's his power to show grace. We need to understand that his power is there for us. I'm going to close with this section here. It's the very last part. That The last part is a celebration of the supremacy of Christ. And we see the supremacy of Christ and not only that he was raised from the dead, that he was seated at the right hand of the Father, that he's above all rule and authority, above all power and dominion. And I specifically think that this is pointing to those in Ephesus who invoked different dark spirits for how they were to live their life. God's saying that Jesus is above all those names that could be evoked. That Jesus is greater. We see the supremacy of Christ, that everything is under his feet. That the kingdoms are his footstool. That we're in submission to him. That he is the head of the church. And he fills everything in every way. 
the supremacy of Christ is the thing that allows him to say as he is getting ready to ascend into heaven that all authority has been given to me. Now do what I ask you to do. Who else can say that? Who else can say that all authority has been given to me? It is at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Jesus is supreme. There really is so much that we can go into this, but for the sake of time and for lack of preparation, I'm not going to go into it. That's why you have to come back tonight and hear how other people do it. I know, I was talking with Matt Jobson about it yesterday, and this is one of the themes that he um, landed on as he studied this passage these last couple weeks. So you might want to be in Matt's group tonight. Um, But pray with me uh, as we wrap things up here. Father, you're amazing. You're amazing that you would love us so much that you would call us sinful and broken people. Your inheritance. Thank you that when you look at us, you see not our sinfulness and our brokenness, but you see our son. Those who have trusted Jesus you see Jesus in us. And God, I do pray that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened, that we would understand these things greater, that we have a better understanding of hope we have, because that changes the way that we live, that we have a better understanding of how much you value us and how your power enables us to live. And help us to see these truths and live them out. In the name of your son, I pray.